Good morning, and welcome to our online gathering. We are thankful that you have joined us this morning. And I'd like to begin our worship service with a reading from Psalm 33. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Let us praise him now in song.
Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love. And now. runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love in death in life I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love my debt is paid there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me And never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me. Your love. Your love is never ending. Your love is never failing. Your
worship you, Jesus. Please pray with me. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for our many blessings. For our very lives and our breath, we thank you. We've come this morning to worship you and praise your name. Thank you for who you are, for your sovereignty, your might, and your holiness. And for your great love, mercy, forgiveness, and justice. Help us, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, to be examples of these things. Give us the wisdom, knowledge, courage, discernment, and patience that we need to pass on to others the amazing grace you have given us. May our words be words that honor you. May our actions be actions that glorify you. May our lives bring you glory and build your kingdom. Please forgive us, Lord, when this is not so. We pray, Lord, for those who need healing and are suffering at this time. 
those who are lonely, who are sick, financially burdened, struggling in their relationships, fearful, anxious, overwhelmed, tired, broken, addicted, hopeless, angry. Draw them to yourself, Lord, that they may have your peace, comfort, healing, and forgiveness. And may their chains of addiction and sin be broken. Now, Lord, prepare our hearts and minds that we may praise your name and hear your word this morning through Pastor Jared. And that we may apply your word to our lives so that our lives may bring you glory. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are created to be part of the glory of God. You can bring glory to God. Isn't that wild? If you're part of his church, then Jesus has prayed for you. Jesus went to the Father in his darkest hour and prayed for the good of his people. Your good. Do you ever think about that? That's what we're gonna tackle this morning. We're gonna be in John chapter 17. And in John 17, Jesus is concluding his final teaching to his followers before he's to be crucified. And that's in John 14 to 16. This is a beautiful, rich passage and it's worth dwelling on and discussing. We learn much about Jesus. We learn a lot about the Father, the Spirit, and ourselves. And this is this powerful teaching for the church. And then after that, in John 17, he concludes his teaching and he prays to the Father. John 17 is is this prayer. And in this prayer, we see and we hear how Jesus prays for the church, how he prays for his followers. So if you're a follower of Jesus, then this is what he prays for you. And it's beautiful. He loves his people. They're on his mind. And if if you aren't sure what you believe or you're wrestling with believing in Jesus, I hope uh, what I'm going to share today is helpful for you too. uh, Because Jesus is such good news. And we're going to see that in this prayer that Jesus believes that we are able to be part of the glory of God. And that is good. It's good and it's powerful and I I love it. Um, As I look at this prayer, I find more about my purpose and the meaning of my life. So I hope that wherever you are in faith, that you might find that too. And Jesus in this passage will pray for uh, many things for his people in this prayer. He actually prays for six things. And today we're gonna look at one specific thing he prays for in the first five verses. So I'll read uh, John 17, one to five, and then we'll discuss the first petition or the first thing he asks for. Before I dive in, consider as I read that we are getting a look at God's very self in community and conversation. God the Son is speaking to God the Father about us and we get to listen in. This is is sacred space. Imagine if you were a child and you overheard your parents talking about you. Perhaps you're nervous they're saying something bad, right? They're whispering. But then you overhear that they're speaking about how much they love you and want good things for you. You hear them speaking about you as an essential, important part of the family. How wonderful would that be for you? Well, in John 17, we're getting a billion times that in this prayer of Jesus to the Father. So let me read. This is John 17, uh, 1 to 5. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. 
All right, in these five verses, we hear the first thing that Jesus asks for. Here's the first petition or ask. Jesus prays for glory for the Son and the Father. The beginning of this section, he says, Father, glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you. And he closes the section in verses four and five, kind of rephrasing that. He says, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. Now, there's a lot in there, <laughs> but, but get the big picture. Uh, the ask is for the glory of the Father and the Son. They're glorifying one another. Now, I've always had a hard time wrapping my head around what glory means. I, I grew up in a church and I heard that word a lot. God is glorious and, and we glorify God and it, it sounds very religious. So let me, let me try to ex do my best to explain it. Uh, in, the, in the Hebrew, that word literally means weight or heavy. So when we call something a weighty matter, it's a big deal. It's a glorious matter. It has depth and su substance. And glory, the way it's used in the scriptures, uh, often means a few things. It communicates power, importance, something worthy of honor. Or a, a glorious person is an honorable person with a good reputation. You you glorify a king who has won a great victory. He's a, a proven one, worthy of honor and praise. You glorify him. That's one of those big meetings. It also means something or someone with a visible splendor. Someone you might stand in awe of or you see a sunrise and it's glorious. You see how there's some overlap there. There's honor, um, this majesty, this power, this thing you stand in awe of, this someone or something that you're just overwhelmed by their power and their honor and their awesomeness. And you just confess that, you, you glorify them. God the Father and God the Son have a relationship where they bring glory to each other. And we're getting a glimpse into the Trinity, into God's self. Jesus has had glory in the presence of the Father before the world existed. And now the time has come for glory to occur again. Okay, if you're still with me, how does all of this glory happen? Well, they are actively doing things that, are making, that make glory happen. They're taking action that brings glory to each other. Jesus is going to do something to bring glory to God. Now, how does all that happen? How is that glory worked out? Well, guess what? It involves us. It involves you. If you're a follower of Jesus, it involves the church of Jesus. Now, stop, pause, know this. It's what I said in the beginning. You are made to be part of the glory of God. You, in your life, in your church community, with your family, you're an image bearer created, you're a created one, an image bearer made to participate in the glory of God and reflect God's glory back to him. You can bring glory to God. And Jesus explains how this is worked out as he prays for the church or as he prays for you, prays for, for us. Look at verse two. He says this in verse two. Since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So Jesus is given authority. The son is given authority over people to make eternal life a reality in those who have been given. And in verse three, he says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And then in verse four, Jesus is saying, I glorified you, the Father on earth, by finishing the work you gave me to do. So Jesus is saying, this is eternal life, to know God in Christ. And when we know him, this prayer is answered. When we know him deeply, it brings glory to God. When we know him, it means that Jesus' work has been accomplished and great glory is won for God. When we know him, God is glorified. 
How does that work? Well, when we know him, it means that God and Christ have been faithful, that God the Father and Christ have been faithful. Look at verse four. He says, Jesus says, I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. Jesus finishes the work given to him. When we deeply know God and Christ, it declares that Jesus has done the work. It brings glory to God. Jesus is saying, God, I've been faithful. I've come to bring this abundant eternal life to people. And this is accomplished as they know you and they know me. You see, we are the proof of the glorious work of Jesus. We are the proof proof of the faithfulness of God the Father and Jesus Christ on the Son. We, and Jesus Christ the Son. We see Christ's faithfulness on the cross and in his death and in his resurrection. And when we believe in that, we're proving their faithfulness. We're showing their faithfulness. And glory to God is being won and given. And we are caught up in this glory. We're part of it. Jesus is so good and we are caught up in his story. Can you believe that? Jesus in his prayers before death as he speaks about glory brings us into all of this. He will pray later in this chapter for the Father to keep his people. Jesus says, Father, keep them with us so that they can be one with us. And a big part of the glory of God is that we know him our trusting and our obeying and our relationship of knowing the Father proclaims the glory of God and the faithfulness of Jesus. This is eternal life. This is life, life. Think about that. This is real life to know Jesus Christ, the sent one, to know the work he has accomplished, to believe and trust and obey him. When we do that, the faithfulness of God is shown that God can redeem and restore and heal and make new creation. And as we believe and trust in him, Glory is one for God. When we do not do that, there's a big problem. And this is why Jesus and Paul and the Torah, the Old Testament scriptures, see the greatest sin, the greatest problem with the world and even with Christians is unbelief or not knowing and trusting God, rejecting knowing God. When we turn away from him, when we reject the work of Jesus and the love of God, that glory is, is hidden. The faithfulness of God is not known. The glory of God does not shine. It's not visibly seen. Uh, we do not find glory in connection to God and we hide the glory of God from others. When we don't believe we're not a city on a hill, but a dark cloud that leaves the world in darkness. There is a big negative here, a terrifying thing to consider. And this is for the church to consider. What if people say they believe in Jesus, but don't really trust him? What if people say they believe in Jesus as a ticket to heaven, but care not about the glory of God? What if people just want God to help them live the American dream and find their own version of the good for them? What if people say they believe, but in our real lives, in their real lives, they don't believe in his faithfulness and power. When we do that, we become a weak church that declares that God is not faithful. We declare God is not glorious. We might think God's good enough to get us into heaven in the way we want it, but we don't declare that he's glorious enough and his work has made us a new creation in today. And we don't trust him in, in real life. And in our real life, when we don't trust, we, we show the world a sinful, untrusting church that lives in the sin of unbelief and that commits all the sins of the world around it. And when we do that, we declare that God is not a faithful one. We declare that Jesus' work is not sufficient for us, that he's not glorious enough for us to be a part of his glory. And we seek our own glory. We continue to seek our own glory. We worship ourselves and created things rather than the creator. We shouldn't do that. <laughs> but when we know him, when we trust him by committing to having him as central to our lives, as Lord, when we trust him enough, when we actually believe he is faithful and worthy enough to be our Lord and savior in our everyday life, when we do that, the glory shines. When we really trust him and get to work in the power of his spirit, when we reject sin, when we reject injustices, when we reject our former ways, and the ways that captivate this world, when we do that, that's 
when we shine the glory of God, when we really trust him in the day to day and recenter around him, that's when we bring him glory. That's when we correctly honor him. When we get united into that, then we live as a city on a hill. Then we shine the glory of God back to him and we shine the light of Christ into the world. Know him, trust him. In your heart, do you know him? He loves this world so much that Jesus is sent into it that all who believe that really trust him would not perish but have eternal life. And God is not glorified when you perish, but when you know him. Rework your heart towards knowing Jesus and the Father. Romans 10, 9 to 13, as Paul's talking to the church in Rome, he says this, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified. One confesses with the mouth and so is saved. And the scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, Paul isn't saying just say one prayer and you're good forever and you don't, it doesn't matter how you live. He's, like, he's saying trust him with your heart. Proclaim him with your lips. A little later, Paul says in that same letter, Therefore, in light of the great mercy of God, renew your mind around Jesus and offer your body as a living sacrifice. We are to know him with our heart. We're to proclaim him with our mouth and body and have a renewed mind. Have it all reworked and all recentered around him. When we do that, we find our true selves. We become grateful people knowing that on the cross, Jesus was the faithful, righteous one that redeems, restores, renews, recreates, and reconciles us so that we might live again as creatures in communion with the Father and the Son, so that we might again bring glory to God. When God made us, he made us to bring him glory and to be in his glory. It's what we're made for. Here are two next steps to consider. What if we did this? What might happen? Dwell on this. Consider this. Dwell on the words of Jesus. Engage your heart and mind around learning more about Jesus. Jesus wants us to know him with our heart and he wants to renew our minds. That happens as we dwell in him. Learn from him by meditating on his words and in prayer. Do that on your own. Do that in community. Then with your body, with those words, with those hands and feet, Know that you can bring glory to God by your Christ-like words and actions. And that you can do dishonor to God when you don't do, <laughs> and you don't do his work and his actions. As you meditate on Christ, though, ask God to show you how to live more Christ-like in the words that come from your mouth and in the actions you take. Paul tells one of the other churches, the church in Colossae, uh, to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. One last thing. Uh, tell us, let's tell one another what we need to know Jesus deeper so that we might be really transformed and bring glory to God. Jesus prays for us together as a community. He prays for his, his tight uh, knit little group of people. And he says, he prays for them, right? We're to confess Christ in word and deed and heart, mind, and body. Together we're the body of Christ. We're made to be part of glory. Let's do this together for the glory of God, for our own sake, and for the world. So tell us, let's be people that share with each other how we can really figure out how to do that in this season of life. It doesn't happen by once a week on, on, online or, or in person. The glory of God doesn't shine to the ends of the earth by some Christians getting together once in a while. That's part of it. We should be joining together for corporate worship, and that's awesome. But the glory really shines as we're caught up in Christ in all of life, heart, mind, body, soul, as we trust him there. And that's hard. So let's spur one another to good deeds and help each other. Let's help each other figure that out. I'm going to close by just praying a blessing for you. God bless you all. 
go forth in the ways of Jesus Christ and bring glory to him and his Father by the power of the Holy Spirit given to you. And by the Spirit of God, let's do that together and help one another do that. Amen. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the Thou, O oh Lord.
And now the benediction from the book of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good, so that you may do his will, working among us, that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen.